Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be taking questions through Slido. You can post your questions uh, through Slido. The login details have already been shared with you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, while uh, uh, the audience is, uh, is uh, logging in and posting their questions, I would also like to add one thing that there are already few questions there. And if you feel a question represents your question, you can just like it. And the more likes it gets, it gets populated up on the charts. So we will have more relevant questions, which more audience is trying to ask. So until uh, uh, the question gets populated here, uh, I'll just open the floor uh, with your permission, sir. Uh, so since uh, you have sounded a beat on economy in recent statements, and uh, I have also taken a cue from you as well, uh, with FX and monetary side now looking to be moving towards relative stability, relative improvement. When do you see, in your view, based on your experience of working in different markets, and as an economist, you think, how long can it take the real economy to start resuming and bouncing back? We have been looking at the negative readings on the LSM index as well. Thank you. I think that's probably the most critical question, which is when do we expect a turnaround in the real economy? So let me share with you our thoughts on how we see developments. There are two things in our view that are going on that are conceptually different. The first is the measures that were undertaken to try to deal with the current account deficit. This had to do with the exchange rate, but this also had to do with the interest rates and a few other actions. They include, for instance, also the actions that were taken on the fiscal side to deal with the large fiscal deficit. All of these actions, whether they are a tightening of monetary, of monetary policy or a tightening of fiscal policy, they work to bring down aggregate demand. So there is an overall series of actions taken on that front. But at the same time, there is a shift in the composition of activity. And that is very important to recognize. And this shift has to do with the movement in the exchange rate. As we have tried to argue previously when the exchange rate was fixed, it was de facto a tax on exporters. And it was de facto a subsidy on importers. One way to look at what's happened on the exchange rate is that that tax has been removed on exporters, and the subsidy that importers were getting has been removed. So there is a shift today on the exporter side, particularly textiles. Volumes are growing. They have been growing. And you mentioned the current account reading of the past two months. In our analysis, and in the analysis that we have shared in various fora, the improvement in the current account is not over the last two months. It has been a steady improvement over at least the past one year. And what is reassuring is that that movement begins once the real exchange rate begins to adjust. So we see that export-oriented sectors are doing better than domestically oriented sectors. But for economists, this is also what you would expect when the real exchange rate begins to reflect the underlying market forces. So we see a shift in composition, but we also see that while exports are leading right now, there is a time that comes sooner or later when the improvement in the sentiment does lead to an improvement in domestic-oriented industries as well. Now, when that improvement comes, is entirely in your hands, because you are also the market participants. We, when we say that things are getting better, we can say that and we can substantiate that with numbers, as we try to do at the State Bank whenever I am asked to give a presentation somewhere. But ultimately, the measure of our success in communication is when you, based upon your analysis, 
feel that the worst case scenarios that you had thought of are not there anymore and that you feel that on the margin the news is more better than worse. It is still early. In other countries that I've worked on, it takes months before there is a turnaround in sentiment that people can bank on. We are prepared for that. The point that I wanted to make is that we should take some encouragement from the positive developments that have already occurred and we should not doubt the resilience of the economy to be able to deal with the challenges that it faces. I, at my level, when I first saw the situation and the imbalances, I am very confident based upon what I have seen over the last two months that by adhering to the reform program, that the turnaround will come sooner rather than later. Thank you, sir. Uh, until now, the most uh, asked question by majority of people is uh, they're looking for clarity on FATF. Maybe you want to comment on that. Uh. So I should tell you that um, on uh, FATF, there there are several things that are happening, but there, we had most recently a delegation that had gone to Bangkok that was led by our federal minister, Mr. Hamad Azhar. And he also is leading a task force that has been created to address the areas identified in this area. The Ministry of Finance has already issued uh, a statement in the press regarding what was achieved over there, so that is with you. I think what I could perhaps usefully do is to share with you a little bit of background as to what are the two parallel streams of work that are happening because there is the FATF and a few weeks ago there was also the APG meetings that took place in Canberra, which I led. And I warn you that this is a very technical area I myself, when I had, when I was asked by, when I was asked to lead the delegation, myself had to learn a lot about all the different fora that have been created in this, in this field. So FATF is a global task force, the Financial Action Task Force. That task force has regional bodies underneath it. There are nine such regional bodies. They are called FSRBs, FATF-style regional bodies. APG, the Asia Pacific Group, is one of those nine regional bodies. Pakistan is a member of APG. All members of a regional body undergo what is called a mutual evaluation. And the visit that took place to Canberra was with regards to the mutual evaluation of Pakistan. Now, what happens in the normal course of events is that when a country and all members of a regional body undergo the evaluation, when that evaluation is done, and if it is the case that concerns are identified in that evaluation, the enhanced effective follow-up, then the regional body, APD, bumps up that country to the global task force and says that this country needs to be dealt with at that level. In Pakistan, Pakistan was already being dealt with by the global task force and was already on the gray list. So as a consequence of the APG meeting, nothing additional is gonna happen because what could have happened, i.e. a country being put on the gray list, had already happened because there is one, there is a parallel way to get onto the gray list which is by nomination, which was the case for Pakistan. So there are two parallel things. One is the progress, the assessment of the progress that Pakistan is making on the FATF action plan. The second is the 
action that will be taken by Pakistan to address the areas identified in the mutual evaluation report from the meetings in Canberra in APG. Now this is a unique situation in uh, FATF. No country has ever been in these two processes simultaneously. And we will get further clarity on how Pakistan will go forward after the meetings that are to take place in October in the FATF plenary. But one thing that I can tell you is that the pace of progress in addressing the areas identified by both the FATF as well as the regional body APG, that pace of progress has increased very significantly, very significantly over the last few months. And that increase in the pace of implementation has also been recognized by key stakeholders who assess Pakistan. The actual assessment, we can't prejudge because that is for the assessors to do. But there has been significant progress of the pace with which Pakistan has been making progress in these areas. Thank you, sir. I think we can draw a positive stance from you on this side as well. Uh, now the next area is about uh, the opening up of uh, local debt markets to foreign investors, and there have been a lot of efforts. We have recently heard about, read about uh, ECC approving a lower tax bracket for foreign investors on 10 instruments in Pakistan as well. Now, there have been concerns in the market as well, and that's actually one of the questions is that uh, that Pakistan, country like Pakistan, which does not have cushion in reserves. So this hot capital, do you think that Pakistan, is, is it a good, source of capital for Pakistan where the environment particularly and just for instance the geopolitical situation gets uh, uh, volatile. So in this kind of environment do you think this this will bring the needed stability to the overall foreign exchange outlook of Pakistan? So let me share with you this is a very important question so I'm glad you raised it and let me share with you the goals of the changes that are envisioned in this area. To share with you the goals of uh, these changes, I need to take you a step back. And uh, we need to talk a little bit about the broader category of portfolio investment by non-residents in Pakistan. Since you, are, since you are participants in the market, I don't need to tell you that um, historically, Foreign portfolio investment in Pakistan has primarily concentrated on equities. And Pakistan has received very, very large amounts of investment from non-resident companies into our stock market. You would know that very well. So the first point to note is that is also hot money. Okay? That issue has never, the hotness of that money has never been discussed before, but it is portfolio investment, just like portfolio investment in debt. And in fact, uh, people will tell you that if you take a very long period of time, foreign investors in dollar terms have made very handsome returns on the Pakistani stock market. That experience has entailed that money leaving the country as well. Okay? And so that when that money has left the country, it has also been an organized process that has not led to problems. Now, the goal of the intended changes is to try to deepen our debt capital markets and to try to address this asymmetry that while our equity markets have benefited a lot from foreign capital inflows, our debt markets have not. So the question is, what would be the benefits from that? Taking into account the size of Pakistan's local debt market, I think one area which will help with the provision of sources of long-term finance for clients, for borrowers, is to have a yield curve 
that has deep pockets along the curve, especially at the longer ends. You would know that right now we have a number of scattered issues along the yield curve. And it's not rocket science to talk about the benefits of developing deep liquid pockets along the curve, three years, five years, seven years, 10 years. As you do that, and as the market has that deep pockets with a lot of turnover and liquidity, that can be the pools of finance that are available to banks as well as other firms to be able to provide longer term credit to clients. Foreign participation can help deepen that market. Okay? So, so one overall goal from these intended changes is to deepen the markets. Second is the clarification. The intended changes de facto do not actually reduce the tax rates. And that is why it is being pitched as a simplification of the tax system for them. Let me explain to you why. Because of double taxation treaties, because of tax treaties that Pakistan has with a number of countries, most of the jurisdictions from which these funds will emerge are countries that already have such tax treaties. The tax rate in these treaties is in the roughly in the 8 to 13 percent or something of that range. But tax treaties are somewhat complicated and for foreign investors, especially considering the negative perceptions of Pakistan in international media, they already have concerns coming into a country like Pakistan. There are a lot of rewards to having a taxation regime in this area, which is simple. And so one of the key goals is not to de facto reduce the rate from what it may be, but rather to make a tax regime that is simple and one that is full and final. One of the most common feedbacks that I have gotten from foreign investors in the countries that I've worked on is that they prefer a tax regime where it's very clear to them upfront how much will be the tax that will be deducted at source when they want to take the money out. And that is what we are trying to do. The second thing is that currently, if you buy treasury bills, the withholding tax is around 10%. But if you buy bonds and you have capital gains, the tax rate is higher. So there is a little bit of a bias or an incentive towards treasury bills. If you want to promote longer term finance, you want to level the playing field. And so one of the intended goals is also to simply level the playing field between shorter term and longer term and therefore encourage more inflows on the longer end. And finally, it can help with reserves. And to address your question about money leaving, it is a correct observation that capital flows, uh, particularly portfolio flows, are a function of many factors, some of which pertain to world interest rates. And in working in other countries, I have seen cases where when world interest rates go up, some capital can flow out. But the point I want to make is that you cannot lose what you don't have. If capital flows out, only that will flow out that came in. Right now, we hardly have anything in terms of non-residence investments in the debt markets. So suppose non-residents do begin to invest in our debt markets, and suppose if global interest rates rise, some of them do leave. What will go out will be a fraction of what came in. And we are prepared, just as we are prepared in other areas as well, to be able to manage inflows and outflows, especially taking into account that the state bank and the economic authorities have dealt with portfolio outflows from the stock market without major issues. So I want to focus more not on the immediate benefit that may come about, but really 
from the deepening of the capital market that we think is something that will help the country. Thank you, sir. Uh, I just back to differ with respect to fundamental difference, again, comparing equity, foreign portfolio investment flows, and debt market flows. Equity investor obviously has more risk appetite, will double down, but the fixed income investor would most likely shy away from taking, putting risk at, uh, putting the capital at risk, and maybe the first one to react and uh, lose away. Uh, uh, again, that's, that's uh, just one observation that I had. Uh, now, I'll, I'll come to the next question, and I'll just try to merge two, three questions and try to, 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 to make one case. Uh, it's about inflation trajectory, interest rates, and growth. Uh, so first of all, uh, again, a lot of people have asked, uh, keeping interest rates high for too long a time, how would stability return? How would uh, the growth come? How would industries uh, be encouraged? And secondly, where inflation is, is a mainly uh, uh, a cost push phenomena uh, rather than uh, a monetary phenomena. Again, that's a view generally people have in our economy. And uh, again, with regards to inflation, uh, the CPI base has recently been, uh, been, CPI has been rebased recently, and that has changed the inflation estimates as well. Now, as we had earlier, higher estimates, uh, would you like to share uh, the estimates now as VP has the, for the inflation going forward? And uh, again, a related question uh, with regards to that, how, how, how would you respond to a lower inflationary environment? Would you immediately consider to uh, uh, change your stance on the monetary policy? Or how, how the transition should happen from a tighter monetary policy to a losing monetary policy. So I know that no conversation with the governor of a central bank can be complete without talking about interest rates and inflation outlook. So this is uh, anticipating that question. I'm surprised it took that long to ask me that question. However, I am also unfortunately going to disappoint you. And um, I feel that I must disappoint you, especially today, because as you know, we have the MPC schedule for Monday. So for me to speak right now would uh, be particularly inappropriate considering how close that meeting is. I think our last views on uh, the outlook for inflation and interest rates were in the last monetary policy statement, which I presume you all read. And uh, in that statement, we also shared our forecast for inflation for this fiscal year. So I ask you to kindly hold your question until uh, we have the MPC. And um, I don't know if there are any analysts here, but we are also going to be having the usual meeting with the analysts after the MPC. And so we would welcome your questions then. But for the sake of clarity of communication and to preserve and strengthen the institution of the Monetary Policy Committee, I think we should uh, not discuss interest rates right now. With regards to the CPI base, uh, so this was something that was in train. As you know, the CPI numbers are not produced by the state bank. We are a user of those numbers, just like you are. You would also have seen the communication from um, the communication that took place when the new CPI numbers were released. I think what I would uh, ask you to focus on is that the government, the Bureau, is going to be publishing the two series. And I think that is a welcome step in the interest of transparency, that you will have ample opportunity to look at the new series and the old series and to see and to get comfortable with it. On our part, we are doing the same. We are in the process of analyzing the data that we have gotten access to with the new CPI. We are going to be running our models on the new CPI. And in due course, once we have completed our analysis, we'd be happy to share with you our thoughts on the new CPI as well. I'll only come back to the bigger picture issue and the longer term point that I made with regards to the outlook for inflation is that many of the reasons why inflation is high right now is because of the need
for the actions that had to be taken to address the imbalances that were accumulated from before. We wanted to get that out sooner rather than later. Therefore, as we said in our monetary policy statement, we expect inflation in the next fiscal year to be much less than in this fiscal year. Thank you, sir. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to ask last one question uh, with regards to overall savings rate. Savings rate with respect to GDP, uh, again, uh, in the overall context, uh, it, it's been repeatedly highlighted that this is uh, one of the chronic issues, the structural issues the Pakistan market has. Uh, so, so, so are there any ideas in pipeline, any steps in pipeline or areas where you see that can spur a real activity in terms of improving the overall savings rate, which again has implications for investment and liquidity in markets? Yeah, I think this is one of the key areas, um, but I would say not only is it saving, you know, it's also private investment. Because if you look at private investment, that has remained flat for a very long period of our history. And in fact, if you look at the correlation with interest rates and so forth, it, there is some correlation, but not a very, very strong correlation, which seems to suggest that there are many structural factors that underlie the fact that private investment in Pakistan is not where it should be. Savings is a very big part of our agenda as well. Um, the agenda that we have on financial inclusion, the agenda that we have on digital banking, on digital payments, I think will go towards helping <coughs> uh, with that goal. I think more broadly, the drive to document the economy that is ongoing right now, and we are beginning to feel some of it, will also help. And finally, we want to work with banks to see also what can be done to make saving instruments more attractive for the savers. I think there is a lot more than can be done right now by working with banks to attract the pools of cash that are sitting outside and not being put in the banking system. Thank you, sir. I think that that's, uh, uh, concludes our Q&A. And uh, I'm really thankful and grateful for your uh, comments here. I'm sure the markets would have a much better understanding and much better guidance. And I'm sure uh, this will also go, this, this process will continue as you already mentioned that you are opening up. And uh, we are really thankful.